everyone and welcome back. It is finally time to get to the lower half of the historically accurate Gonzo Ensemble from The Muppets Christmas Carol, or as I have just shortened it to the Victorian Gonzo Ensemble, because that's a mouthful otherwise. And we are going to be getting into, um, a lot of pantaloonery today. No, I did not make that term up. Yes, I am going to try and bring it back because it's wonderful. But this brings up the question of what do we call this bifurcated garment? Because there are a lot of terms out there. There are a lot of options and understanding what was used when and what exactly it referenced is something that I think is pretty important. Generally, we tend to refer to these things as trousers. And as a very broad sense, it's a term that we know was used historically to some extent, and it's a term that we still use today. It is much more common over in England than it is in America, where we tend to say pants. But both terms have some very rich and complex history to them, and do have some very uh, specific things that they refer to. Now, these are not the only terms. Of course, you know trousers and pants, but there's also breeches and bloomers and pantaloons and drawers and trunks. So there's a whole range of different terminologies that we know were used historically, sometimes for very specific garments or in very specific regions or for very limited windows of time. So let's take a little trip back in time and explore some of that varied terminology. But before we do, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor for this week's video, Wondrium. Wondrium is an entertaining and educational video streaming service that is full of amazing content. I started my channel with the goal of sharing educational content that isn't usually accessible because we should all have the opportunity to continue learning and growing. And that same goal is visible throughout Wondrium's content. They have over 6,000 hours of video courses, documentaries, and series. Whether you are interested in historical events, science, modern technology, or even learning how to bake, this is the place for you. Within the first few minutes, I had a watch list of dozens of videos. Along with my journey this week into discovering some of the origins to words like trousers and pants, I found more questions and answers about etymology and the history of language. Thankfully, one of the first suggested courses was Old English Literature, Language is History. I had no idea how interconnected Indo-European languages were. No wonder we have some incredibly universal terms for clothing. And no matter how much time I spend digging through research like that, there is always something more to learn. And Wondrium provides the perfect way to expand my knowledge with engaging and thorough content. If you've ever wondered about anything, Wondrium will be your new favorite place. And they're giving viewers a great offer of a free trial. Just visit wondrium.com slash Nicole Rudolph to start discovering today. And thanks to Wondrium for sponsoring this week's video. Now back to our loquacious two-legged garments, because I have spent the last few days researching this, coming across all sorts of terrible puns and dad jokes from the 19th century. That's right, they really thought the concept of pants versus trousers was absolutely hilarious. Because if you didn't know, trousers is the term that tends to be used in England, and pants is the term that tends to be used in America. And this developed at some point and separated out and became a source of not only humor, but great concern as well. And when it comes to the humor, oh, there's some wonderful ones. Some of my favorites were, should I use the term pant? Oh no, that is far too vulgar. You should use the term trousers instead. All right, well then I will begin to call the pantry the trousery. Or perhaps you would enjoy, what is the difference between a man and a dog? A man wears trousers, a dog pants. Yes, these are just that terrible, <laughs> but they're great. And it just shows the, absolute absurdism that is this whole situation. As for the terms that we're dealing with, there are just so many, but trousers and pants are the two that we tend to get for modern day the most. So let's start by looking at trousers and figure out the history of that. If we go pretty far back, we start seeing trousers used as of the early 17th century. This is not always in the standard spelling that we have today, but it is clearly meant to be something akin to that. And we're pretty sure that the term trousers comes from Irish and Scottish Gaelic, which terms like truce refer to what we would typically think of as trousers today. Trousers in their earliest format under that term referred to something that was a full length legged garment in difference to breeches. Breeches were very popular throughout the 
16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, and they tend to end just below the knee in a banded style. They have lots of different variations on how tight or how broad they were. You get into things like trunk hose and all sorts of really broad stuff in the 16th and 17th centuries, but they slim down throughout the 18th century and breeches are sort of the standard everyday men's fashion. Now, this is in comparison to trousers, which are very functional garments. They are typically worn by people who are laboring, by soldiers, by sailors. They can be fitted, they can be broad, but they are meant to be longer length garments. And they start coming into more typical popularity in the late 18th century, as we will get to. But first, let's go backwards and figure out pants so we can end up at the same point. Pants is the shortened format of pantaloons, and pantaloons has a much older history. So this is where I'm getting a little out of my depth for doing primary source research. It's just a little too far back. There's not a lot of primary sources for that era, and there's likely nothing that gives us the exact, oh yes, this is where the term pantaloons comes from. So this is where it's thought to have come from currently, but of course there are some questions as to whether or not this is an accurate etymological history to this term. So if we go back to the 16th century, through the 18th century, there is a particular form of theater called Commedia dell'arte, which is coming out of Italy and is very, very popular. This particular type of theater tends to really rely on character tropes. So the moment the character walks on stage, you know exactly who you are dealing with. They dress a certain way, they act a certain way, and you already know what the character is, and they play out many different stories with these different trope characters. One of the tropes is of this older, very miserly, conniving man who is usually very greedy, very money interested, and just all of the things that go into that trope. And he specifically wears a lot of red and either wears red breeches with red stockings or he wears an entire full length trouser type garment that covers the feet as well. It's this long, tight red trouser like garment that picks up his name supposedly. This character in Italian is called Pantalone and in English Pantaloon. Now, the actual origins of the character's name are also in a bit of question. Supposedly, it is either from Saint Pantaleon, which is the really popular saint in Venice, and this character was very often portraying a Venetian merchant or it might possibly come from the term for Venetian merchants that was occasionally used, Piante Leone. So there's a possibility that that's where this term, this name got picked up, and then it started being applied to that particular bifurcated garment, and it just sort of carries through. It makes a lot of sense because they are very similar terms, but of course there's no like great document that literally lays that out for us from the 16th century of, oh yes, this is why we called it this, and then we called it this, it's fine. We don't know exactly, but it does definitely make sense. As for the term pantaloons, originally, if you're looking, say, at the 17th century, it's referring to something that is a very voluminous garment. But gradually, as we make our way through the 17th and into the 18th century, it starts to slim down. So in the 18th century, it is generally referring to a particular type of garment that is worn mostly by military. It's worn as a uniform, and it is much more snugly fit to the legs. In fact, by the time we reach the early 19th century, they specifically say that pantaloons are very, very tight trousers. So it seems that trousers is used as a more general term and that pantaloons is a very specific subset of trousers referring to the tightness of the leg. Now, why all of these came into fashion in the 19th century is another big question. See, breeches obviously had been the standard of fashion up through the late 18th century and something happened to transition this or more like a lot of things happened to transition this. So many of these elements sort of coalesced one thing that we can look at is the fact that these pantaloons and trousers were commonly being worn by the military, and military-style garments really took off in fashion in the early 19th century, particularly with the Napoleonic Wars and the very patriotic things that were coming out of that. So military fashions were being adopted as everyday fashions. We also have the simplification of garments going from the 18th to the 19th centuries, which is somewhat influenced by classical styles, Greek and Roman styles, getting rid of a lot of the extra fluff and trim and and 
different things to sort of streamline it into the early 19th century. We also have the push for sort of a pastoralization in even the upper class clothing where they were sort of mimicking the lower classes and making that sort of simplified, very pastoral clothing as they saw it, much more popular for everyone. And you also have things like the French Revolution that were taking place where if you weren't really into that sort of stuff, you were gonna be pushed that way anyway, because there's a reason why that particular group was called sans culottes. They were without breeches. Quite literally, they wore trousers instead. It was a way of signifying that you were part of the working class. And so all of these things coalesce into more working class clothing, more practical clothing, more plain clothing becoming popular in the early 19th century. And trousers and pantaloons were a big part of this. And gradually breeches became something only for more formal events, became something for court wear, something for livery uniforms, just really fancy formal attire. And trousers became the everyday. Lots of different types of trousers, lots of different names for exactly what type of trousers and lots of different details in them. Now, as for the term pantaloons becoming the term pants, that's where all of the controversy comes in. I could find references to pants as of the 1840s. They didn't seem to necessarily be someone selling a pair of pants or talking about wearing a pair of pants so much as court records and other documentation of that style that was saying a pair of pants was stolen. This makes me wonder if those early versions were literally just a shorthand of sorts rather than just using it as an everyday term, that it's specifically a shorthand version. And by the time we get into the mid 19th century, we start to see it used more and more commonly by Americans as the alternative for pantaloons, which kind of becomes a more old fashioned term, no matter where you are as you move through the 19th century, it gets used less and less as you go on. Pants then becomes a standard American terminology for trousers, much to the chagrin of the English and to the upper class societies in America who really do not want to use that term. They really avoid it as much as possible. There is great humor and great concern in this. Some people are very concerned because it is a vulgarization of a language. So they want to keep things proper. They want to keep things as they should be. And using the term pants is just too casual and inappropriate, especially for certain circumstances. There's one really hilarious story that I found printed of a congressman from America who went over to speak to parliament and stopped mid-sentence at a very concerning point. He said, why tariffs are like a pair of suspenders, sometimes tight and sometimes loose, but Uncle Sam needs them just the same to keep up his. And here he paused for a moment and cleared his throat while apparently the entire house sat with bated breath in concern that he might not use the word trousers, but instead say pants in such a formal situation to use such a vulgar term. And perhaps he'll just say pantaloons or at least overalls. Anything is better than pants being used in parliament. And after this clearing of his throat, the congressman continued to keep up his running expenses. And at which point the entire house erupted into laughter, realizing he wasn't going to use that concept at all. So that was one of those great little fun stories. And there are plenty like that where what terminology you use based on the situation can be a little bit humorous, but on a more formal sense, pants as of the late 19th century, 1890, had not yet been taken into the dictionary to be a formal term. Though it had commonly been used by Americans for decades at that point, it was still not formally in the dictionary. And I found one amazing article that said that it actually should be in there and was very forward about their feelings on this particular matter, stating, if the dictionary will not sanction the word pants, then let us make the deliberate rebellion against the dictionary. Let us cry out, the war is inevitable, let it come. <laughs> so he thought that pantaloons was quote, priggish, trousers was too antiquated, and that pants was the way of the future, and we should forcibly make sure that that ends up in the dictionary and part of our standard lexicon. <laughs> Just, just wonderful that it needs to be that dramatic, but in the 19th century, it's always dramatic. As for the terms, as we move forward into the 20th century, that's where things get a little bit interesting. You might have heard pantaloons referred to as something of a women's undergarment of the 19th century, the same as we have sometimes heard bloomers referring to a women's undergarment of the 19th century. But in reality, neither of those was used 
as such. There were pantalettes and there were drawers for women's undergarments, but pantaloons and bloomers were not. What you do see is that bloomers, named after Amelia Bloomer, referred to the dress reform movement style of trousers that women were wearing in the mid 19th century. Prior to them being named after Amelia Bloomer, they were very often referred to as pantaloons or just generally trousers. But I did find plenty of articles that called them pantaloons. And when we come to the early 20th century after pantaloons has really stopped being a common use term, gets picked up again in the 19 teens to refer to what they called harem pants. So these broad, silky, loose trousers that were part of high fashion for women at the early part of the 19 teens were sometimes also referred to as pantaloons. And this term seems to have stuck around in reference to some sort of bifurcated women's garment that is of more casual undress. So it could be in reference to those wider trousers, but it could also be in reference to things like combinations or drawers, silky pajamas, or any sort of other garment that is meant to go underneath or be very, very casual, not something to go out and about in. And it seems to be advertised and used throughout the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s in this manner. And so once you reach the late 1940s, there is a slight shift. And that's because as we reach the end of the 1940s, there is a great shift in the way that we are doing fashion for women. We go from much slimmer styles to much broader style and petticoats come back in. And there is a great fashion for all things Victorian and 19th century and all the fluff and the ruffles and the aesthetics of the air. It's very nostalgic. And along with petticoats, they bring back in some sense, these little under drawers that they are sometimes calling pantaloons. They're cotton, lacy, roughly silky. They like to use the term pantaloons as a nostalgic choice, even though it wasn't actually used in the era like that. It just referred to men's trousers, but it sort of got co-opted. And I have a feeling that bloomers went through a similar thing. And I have a feeling that the term pants also went through a similar thing, but over in England. I couldn't find as much reference material on that because pants is a term that is used pretty broadly in the early to mid 20th century. So finding exact references wasn't as simple, but it seems like there's a good chance it too went through that same sort of nostalgic transition <laughs> and became a term for women's undergarments at that point in time. And that's where we are left with today in terms of terminology. So all of this to say that I'm just going to be using trousers when it comes to the reference for this garment that I am working on because we're in England in the 1840s and trousers is what would have generically been used. The trousers that Gonzo himself is wearing are really standard for the era. They seem to be out of a smaller check or plaid style of wool. They are pleated in the front. They are not super tight down the legs. They have a fly front rather than a fall front, which we'll get into more. And they are not super long, meaning that they are the standard trouser length that we're used to today. They sort of end at the top of the shoes. There are alternatives to this. The really fashionable trousers that I was finding actually extend down further over the shoes and sometimes stirrup under them. So those stirrup pants from the 80s and 90s were quite popular already in the 1840s with gentlemen. This of course creates some problems and the fact that there's a lot of wear and tear on the bottom stirrup of the trousers. So there were actually inventions of things like little rubber strips that you could put down around the bottom of your trouser hem in order to keep it from wearing out quite as quickly, all sorts of things like that. I have decided to stick with just the standard straight version because that's what Gonzo has, that's perfectly accurate, and that allows me to wear these trousers for other purposes so I don't have to worry about always wearing it with heeled shoes that are at the right heel height and dealing with the wear and tear that comes on those stirrups. It's just too much effort for me. So I'm sticking with the straight cut type of hem, which I actually, interestingly enough, won't be able to do until I get the shoes done, which is one of the next projects. I have a lot of projects for this. Actually, speaking of that, next week, I won't have a typical video because it is a holiday week and I would like to take some time not editing. What I am going to do instead is do at least a couple lives where I'm going to be working on Gonzo's red 
overcoat. I thought this was going to be a wonderful and festive idea given the week and it allows me to spend some time talking with you guys, answering questions you might have of all of these videos that I've done so far and about what I'm working on in the future. Obviously I'm not going to have this entire ensemble done for the official Christmas holiday. It's just not gonna happen. I was hoping to get it done for the next weekend think that's going to be the shoe video instead just because I want to one make sure I have enough time to do everything right I still have to do the shoes the overcoat and the hat and the cravat and a few other accessory pieces that I would really like to have appropriately done rather than just getting by and that's gonna push me back at least another week. On top of that, I do also wanna make sure that I'm waiting for some snow. And though we are supposed to theoretically, as of right now, predicted to have a white Christmas where I'm at, I don't know about after that. And I like, said, won't have this done for that. So give me a little bit of time. I'd rather do this right and get every little detail done correctly than have it done on time, whatever that means. For me, this was an adventure in learning about the menswear of this era. So back to that. For the rest of this video, I'm going to show you working on the trousers, but because I have made button fly front trousers before, albeit in slightly different style and in machine rather than all by hand, I don't feel like I wanna go through every single step of the process and talk about exactly what I'm doing. Instead, I'd rather take this opportunity to talk about the stylistic things and the construction things that are specific to this era. The first place to start is with the fabric. I knew that I needed a heavier weight wool than is pretty common for suiting, so I ended up going with one of the wools from the historical fabric store, which does have that necessary heavier weight that was really common for trousers in that era. They talk a lot about making sure that you have a good quality wool so it doesn't bag out at the knees, meaning that as you bend your knees, you end up with like a permanent stretched out bubble there. So that was something I wanted to keep in mind as well. As the fabric arrived and I started to work on it, I realized it wasn't straight, it wasn't square, which is kind of a problem when I'm working with plaids and checks. So I just stretched it and steamed it back into the square shape. That's a really common thing for modern fabrics. I then lay down all the pattern pieces individually on a single layer because there is no way I'm going to be trying to cut this double layer. I need to match up all of those plaid markings and it needs to be single layer. So I was able to get everything lined up and matched. So the fronts are the same, the backs are the same. And for the most part, they will match up on the side seams. They have a bit of a different curve, so it won't be perfect but it should be pretty close. I am making sure that I mark all of the parts as much as I can because there is no way that I want to get off on dealing with a plaid this complex. I'm then able to start moving on to the front closure, which is where choices get to be made because at the beginning of the 1840s, it's actually probably more common to have fall fronts than fly fronts. Fall fronts are a remnant of the 18th century. They extend further across the front and they developed out of fly fronts that were really popular in the 17th century. The fall front developed as the waistcoat shortened and the front of the trousers or breeches was exposed. So they wanted a smooth flat front and that's likely why that fall front developed. As we reach the 1840s, they start to have a bit of a problem with this because they've extended the fall front further and further across as the waistcoats get shorter and shorter to the point where it extends across the entire front to the side seams. And well, that becomes a problem when you want to do pleats on the fronts of your pants. So what they choose to do in this era for the pleated fronts is one of two things, either to do a very narrow fall front, almost frankly, comically narrow, or to go back to the fly front style. And that's what I've chosen to do because it is a more modern style. We really haven't changed from the fly front since the 1840s, though this style does have a button closure rather than a zipper closure. It's not terribly different than what we have today. And it's this style that seems to really start to take hold as of that early 1840s point. The fall front becomes a bit more antiquated, just like the breeches. But it is such an interesting transition period for this weird, weird style of super narrow fall front or super wide fall front. The wheel of fashion turns and we move on to the next thing. Now, as I noted, this isn't the first time we've done fly fronts. They were around before the fall front was. And that's one of the reasons why, interestingly enough, we do refer to them as a pair of trousers today or a pair of pants or whatever. They are in a pair. They are two legs, essentially, even though they are connected. And that's because they didn't used to be. In fact, when you go back to, say, the 
15th century, you're going to find that the men are wearing hose that is essentially like two really, really long socks. And they tie about the waist, but they do not attach to each other. That's the reason why you still see skirted garments over these. That's the reason why you see cod pieces in the 16th century. They have to do something to cover up that split. The shirt will be tucked down between the legs, so it's not like it exposes everything, but you know, having something to cover the fact that you've just got two separate legs is probably a good idea. But as we made our way into the late 16th, early 17th century, they merge, they get stitched together. But by that point, we've already started referring to it as a pair of breeches, a pair of trousers, a pair of pantaloons. So it's already developed that concept of two separate legs, even if they are attached to one another. As for the fly front construction, I am going off of what I'm used to doing, but I do have a little bit of a reference material piece because I was fortunate enough in one of my many orders from Witchy Vintage that Paula was kind enough to send an extra of a pair of boys' trousers from probably the second quarter of the 19th century. They are entirely hand-stitched with the exception of some modern adjustments and alterations, and they do have a buttoned fly front, and the way that they are constructed, even by hand, with what is clearly a probably pre 1860s style is just the same way that I've always done these fly fronts for modern trousers. They haven't really changed much. I did find it interesting that the originals I was looking at had almost no structure to them. They didn't have any interfacing. They even forego some of the stitching that I thought should have been there but they were meant to be summer trousers. They were meant to be washable. And you don't necessarily want to put another layer of linen in between all of these layers of cotton because it might shrink when you're laundering these. Clearly these trousers were meant to be laundered. They were meant to be worn pretty hard. So that is an option, depending on what you're going for. You don't have to put all the structure in. If you're planning on washing these trousers, you definitely don't want to. And in reality, I probably didn't need to. I probably could have just relied on the wool and the polished cotton. They are stiff enough. They are going to be able to hold up to the buttons and buttonholes pretty well. And in the future, if I'm working with the wool this heavy and this rigid again, I probably won't put those extra layers of linen interfacing in. So that's a note for the future. because I am doing a pleated front, I had to go with a full side seam pocket. And I did find an original example of a very similar pair of wool trousers that had that particular style of pocket, had the fly front, had the pleats. So I used that as a main reference for what little bit of construction techniques I could glean. One of the things I did notice when I looked very, very carefully at the side where you could just see the pocket opening was that they did face the cotton pocketing with the same wool. This was only the case that I could see for the back side of the pocketing. I don't know about the top side. I don't know if they did have an inlay like I chose to do that folded over the front part of that pocketing and sort of encases the entire entrance to the pocket in wool or whether it was just that bottom edge where you're very likely to have your pocket sort of pull back if you put your hands in your pockets a lot or if you have curvier hips you'll find a gap there and the other piece of wool is what will prevent you from really seeing the pocket but I think it looks better to have both sides of the entrance to the pocket done with some sort of facing so that's what I'm doing here using the edge of the wool which 
is a little bit obvious that it has the big words King Wool woven into the selvage edge, but the selvage edge is a good one, and then I don't have to worry about wear and tear and fraying. And it took good advantage of the fabric width that I had, so I get all of my things laid out on one width of fabric. Interestingly enough, one of the other reasons for facing the pocket, as well as the reason why I put in that little strip of linen at the beginning, is because pockets have a tendency to grow. That pocket opening, as you put your hands in, as you put different objects in, has a tendency to stretch. And that's not something that you want. It will gap. So you want to put extra layers in there to make sure that it is really rigid and isn't going to stretch out. In fact, I found lots of documentations from the era that specified you should just stitch up your pockets if you are the sort of person that has a tendency to stick their hands in their pockets all the time. Just stitch them up. Get rid of that temptation. I'm not planning on doing that anytime soon because I have a lot of things that need to go in my pockets, but I will try and keep my hands out of my pockets the best I can, or at least reinforce them enough that they won't stretch out. Then we are able to start adding the fronts to the backs. I do choose to set it up so I have the fronts completed and then they get stitched to the backs. I find this easier than doing them as leg tubes where I then have to do the fly front as the whole thing is already together. I'd rather just do it flat. But this particular type of trouser poses a little bit of a difficulty. I did try and match up the lines of the plaid the best that I could along the side seams, but they have a fairly different curve, especially down at the bottom. We start off with the hips being fairly straight for both, but as we get towards the hem of the trousers, an interesting thing occurs that seems to be very distinct to this era, and that is that the front portion of the trousers is shaped in the leg like it's a peg trouser, so it gets narrower as we go down towards the ankle, but the back has a flare. And this creates a really interesting side seam that curves towards the front of the trousers as it goes down over the ankles and allows space to get over the shoes or the boots. And I wanted to do that style for my trousers. There are plenty of examples that just have a straight leg straight down the seam on the outside, don't curve at all. You can do that too, but this just was so much more fun. On to dealing with the waistbands. Uh, interestingly enough, each side is done separately and there is a gap in the center back. The fronts are pleated up with four or five small pleats, depending on the amount of fabric that you're trying to pleat in. They seem to do that rather than really big ones. Then the waistband is applied on top of all of this. This era does have separate waistbands and does still use braces or suspenders. I am going to be doing that. I don't have the buttons just yet. I don't have the braces just yet, so I won't be showing them complete with that portion, but I am going to be doing that because that seems to be the typical way of keeping your trousers up. You can tighten up your waistband to the point where it holds up, but they actually do talk about in the era that that could possibly be bad for your health, your digestive health, having something constricting around your midsection like that. So they seem to rely more on the ability of your suspenders to hold it up. And you do have some options to pull it in a little bit in the back as well. The front is dealt with by way of all of those buttons and buttonholes. I did notice the original that I was somewhat basing this off of for construction had a buttonhole at the base of the waistband rather than two of them on the waistband. I thought this was interesting. I'm not sure that I liked the technique that I used to accomplish this. I really hope that at some point I can get my hands on an original like this to see exactly how they managed a buttonhole right on that very, very bulky seam. But for the moment, it creates a really interesting and very historical look to this garment. As for fastening up the back, well, that doesn't have any darts or anything to create shaping. Instead, it relies on little straps, just like we put onto the waistcoat back. And this means that I can sort of snug in the trousers around the waist, since I did notice that the waistband rose well above where my actual waist was in back, which makes sense from the perspective of braces, but doesn't really allow you to support around your waist terribly well. But adding this little buckle strap in back means that I can adjust it to fit me snugly as much as I need it to for the temporary time until I get a proper pair of braces fitted out.
I have to say, this is like the least attractive pair of pants when sitting possible. Like, I, how do you, there, there is, there's so much fabric and no place to put it. Like, I just can't, I, I can't. 